Good evening and welcome everyone. I am Kathy Nalabaiko, President of the Ukrainian Institute of America. It gives me great pleasure to welcome such a robust audience of over 300 registered participants to tonight's webinar, Ukraine under Zelensky, where is it heading? For those of you who may not be familiar with the Ukrainian Institute, please allow me to introduce our organization. The UIA, as we are affectionately referred to, is a nonprofit membership-based organization located in New York City that is dedicated to promoting the art, music, and literature of Ukraine and the Ukrainian diaspora. We serve both as a center for the Ukrainian American community and as America's window on Ukraine, hosting art exhibits, concerts, film screenings, poetry readings, literary evenings, children's programs, lectures, symposia, educational programs, and now webinars, all open to the public. Along with many other arts and cultural organizations, as a result of COVID-19, over the last few months, we have had to pivot to providing our programming online since our building, along with many others, has unfortunately had to remain closed. While this was no easy task, we were very fortunate to have a group of talented and dedicated staff members who have quickly shifted our offerings to an online format. Every day, we post something new online, either an article, a clip from a former concert, or a virtual art tour, to name a few examples, on all of our social media channels, which include Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. We also send a weekly email to the more than 5,000 people on our mailing list, recapping these posts every Friday. If you are not on that list, but would like to be, please send an email to director at ukraineninstitute.org to request that your name be added. Similarly, if you are interested in membership, please either visit our website at www.ukraineninstitute.org or email director at ukraineninstitute.org for more information and for an application. Finally, since we are funded largely by personal contributions, we ask, that if you enjoy this evening's program, you consider making a donation as a gesture of your appreciation. During the course of the evening, I will send out the link via the chat room to which you can make a donation. Of course, you may always visit our website and make a donation through the link that's always available there. Now on to the program. Our topic this evening is particularly timely given that President Zelensky is now a little over one year into his term as Ukraine's leader. Our moderator, Adrian Kudetnitsky and our panelists, Marta Dushok and Dr. Alexander Mottet, will examine the impact of President Zelensky's administration thus far and the impact it's had on various aspects of the Ukrainian experience, from its imprint on culture to its impact on foreign policy and the direction of governmental reform. The Ukrainian Institute is extraordinarily honored to have this distinguished group of experts with us today to weigh in on these very important issues. Our moderator, Adrian Kudetnitsky, is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, where he established its Ukraine program and served as co-director of its Ukraine in Europe program. He is also co-executive director and board member of the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter. He has been president of Freedom House, a US headquartered international NGO focused on the advancement and monitoring of democracy. In addition, he serves as a member of the Ukrainian Institute of America's Advisory Board and of the Foreign Affairs Advisory Board of the World Congress of Ukrainians. Panelist Maksim Dichok is Associate Professor at the Departments of History and Political Science at Western University, Fellow at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs, and Adjunct Professor at the National University of the Kiev Mohila Academy. She has published five books. In addition, she has published numerous articles in various journals and regularly provides media commentary. Her doctorate is from Oxford University and she researches mass media, memory, migration, and history. Our other panelist, Dr. Alexander Moffitt, okay. professor of political science at Rutgers University, Newark, as well as a writer and painter. He served as Associate Director of the Harriman Institute at Columbia University from 1992 to 1998, a specialist on Ukraine, Russia, and the USSR, and on nationalism, revolutions, empires, and theory, 
He is the author of 10 nonfiction books and numerous fiction books. Dr. Mate is also the editor of 15 volumes, including the Encyclopedia of Nationalism and the Whole Damar Reader, as well as a contributor of dozens of articles to academic and policy journals, newspaper op-ed pages, and magazines. He also has a weekly blog entitled Ukraine's Orange Blues. A native New Yorker, Dr. Mate received his doctoral degree in political science, master of philosophy in political science, and master of international affairs from Columbia University. His Bachelor of Arts in History was also earned from Columbia College. Thank you again to each of these experts for finding time in their very busy schedules to lead this evening's discussion. So now, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to turn the evening over to our moderator, Adrian Kvitnitsky. Uh, thank you, Kathy, and thank you, robust audience. Uh, it's, it's very uh, heartening uh, to see the degree of uh, interest in developments in Ukraine and uh, the care with which uh, the diaspora and uh, many of the people uh, who are friends of the Ukrainian Institute and participate in its programs uh, give uh, to the processes and uh, uh, currents uh, that uh, uh, are uh, that that are moving through Ukraine and influence Ukraine, and we have uh, a really uh, good group of interlocutors uh, who bring uh, very different areas of expertise to the mix. And I'm particularly glad that Marta Dechok, who studies uh, more the sort of the cultural, uh, civic uh, sphere and media. Uh, uh, which is also an extremely important part of Ukraine's uh, democratic development and the formation of Ukraine's national identity. And Alex Modell, of course, who uh, covers the traditional uh, political science dimensions, but extends well, well beyond it to some of the spheres that Marta professionally covers. Anyway, we're now, as uh, Kathy uh, indicated, uh, it's 13 months uh, and counting uh, since uh, Volodymyr Zelensky uh, took the oath of office as the uh, sixth uh, president of uh, Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Zelensky started with a huge uh, approval rating and strong support of the public after having been elected with 73% of the vote. He had incredible trust uh, figures uh, in, in the polling data for the, for the first six or eight months of his uh, uh, presidency. But I uh, always like to remind people that perhaps the coat of arms of the Ukrainian presidency is a sharp downward arrow pointing in the, in the negative. And that is the fate of uh, support, public support and public opinion in terms of its presidents. And Mr. Zelensky has, though he has retained a reasonable degree of support, has not escaped this trend. From a plus rating of above, you know, 70% approval and 20% disapproval, uh, a poll was issued a couple days ago, which now shows 41% trust in the president and only 13 of total trust in him and 50% uh, mistrust. So now he, uh, who just months ago was the only politician with uh, high, high trust ratings is regressing to the mean of, of past Ukrainian, Ukrainian presidents. I hope in the course of our conversation, we'll have some insights into why that might, uh, might happen. Those of you who follow Ukraine both closely or maybe even episodically uh, will know that Ukraine has undergone uh, a transition from one government to another already in the Zelensky administration. There have been several ministers of education, uh, uh, several ministers of health, fits and starts, appointments made, appointments uh, removed, uh, a bit of, uh, I would say, turbulence and confusion in the orderly administration of state affairs. Uh, and I think we'll be able uh, to talk all about those things. Today, for example, a uh, temporary minister of education was appointed uh, because another problem has emerged in the presidency. And that is that after Mr. Zelensky was elected, he brought in 
254 members of parliament and the servant of the people party, his political party, into parliament. That represented 254 out of 423 seats that are currently filled because the, the, the seats from the occupied areas of Crimea and the Donbass are not currently filled. So it's a huge, a huge majority. And he is not now able, for example, to get support to vote in his minister of education. Uh, the government, the second government he put in place was not able to get approval of its yearly plan of action uh, again. And there was an analysis recently that showed that, this, that out of the 254 people that were elected and selected by Zelensky to be part of his team in parliament, he can roughly now count on the support of about 170 of them. And many of them are, and even among those, there may be uh, some, uh, some wavering. So from a full head of steam, from uh, confidence and optimism, uh, Ukraine is moving into a more uh, difficult, uh, difficult slog. Uh, and I think we'll explore the reasons for this and uh, uh, with, with our distinguished speakers. And maybe with, before Marta goes on, and not to prompt you in what you say, but I, I just want to say that my sense was that although Petro Poroshenko was criticized heavily by civil society and by many reformers and reform activists. Among the Kyiv and Ukrainian intelligentsia, nevertheless, I would say that the majority of them regarded the Zelensky presidency with a higher degree of disapproval and skepticism and may have voted with their, you know, holding their noses for Poroshenko, but were never on board the uh, Zelensky team. Although in the first instances when he named a wave of reformers to his government, uh, I think that created uh, some period of general kind of calm and acceptance that maybe, maybe this guy was getting it right. But I'll turn it to you to talk about where society is, where civil society is, where the media are, and where the intelligentsia are in uh, their relationship to Mr. Zelensky and and how they perceive uh, his, his uh, uh, time in office. Marta, you'll have 12 minutes or so to uh, make your case. Thank you, 12 minutes. That's quite an interesting timeline. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this. This is my first webinar, so it's, a, it's kind of an exciting new experience for me. Um, I'd like to start by actually saying that I hope that Olena Zelenska is doing well. Uh, as you probably know, she was diagnosed with COVID-19 on June the 12th, um, and President Zelensky has been in self-isolation, and he's due to come out of that tomorrow. Uh, but there's been actually very little information about the uh, how, how Olena Zelenska is doing, and very little, very few statements coming out of the president's office, uh, which is in sharp contrast with what we saw happening in Canada when Prime Minister Trudeau's wife was diagnosed with COVID and with Boris Johnson when he had, and we have regular information about what was going on. And yet coming out of Ukraine, we were getting very little information through the media. And that speaks to the relationship between the president Zelensky and the media, that it is very uh, distanced relationship. And that's actually what I wanted to focus on mainly because that's what I study is uh, what's going on in media and the president and the administration. But before I do that, um, the topic the, of our seminar is where is Ukraine going under Zelensky? And I was thinking about that and I don't have a crystal ball. It's an excellent question. But the forward looking discussion that I hope we're going to have um, I think of it more as a historian. So when I was thinking about this question, I was thinking, well, to understand where things are going or might be going, I always like to look at the past and the present as a sort of preview. So what is it that we know about Zelensky and his policies and his worldviews? And Adrian, you and I were talking about this last summer in Kiev about my question is why did Volodymyr Zelensky wants to become president. 
And I was still grappling with that question. And at the time I was convinced that this was a political project, that it wasn't necessarily his initiative. Um, and he didn't really campaign on any kind of a platform. It was just this populism. And yet he did win this landslide, as we know, and has retained his popularity. Yes, it's dipped, but his popularity remains really high. Um, so what is it, what, what role is the media playing in all of this? Um, but the, the other point that I wanted to raise about Zelensky trying to understand how he operates and where he's coming from also came out of a conversation I had in Kiev last summer with Mufanda Lihachava. And she said that Zelensky is post-Soviet. And I think that's a good lens to try to understand what he's doing and how he's behaving. His, his reference points, the way he sees the world, his self, his identity, still has very much of a Soviet flavor to it. He is um, not the way he thinks about being Ukrainian, the way he thinks about the world. We see this, the Soviet sort of imprint is still very much there. The post-Soviet part is he thinks like a capitalist. And we think of him as an actor, but he was also a very successful businessman. And if we look at what he was producing uh, with his company, his outreach was to the post-Soviet space. So he doesn't have necessarily this clear Ukrainian identity, whether it's Ukrainian language or Russian language. He's thinking of it more in this sort of, how do I entertain, how do I make money? And who's my audience? It is still both Russia and Ukraine and Belarus and that entire cultural space. So I think that's a way to try to understand how he's formulating his policies. Um, something that I was worried about that a lot of people were worried about is what would happen with this issue of freedom of speech? Because um, someone, the way he behaved during the election campaign, he pretty much ignored the mainstream media. He used social media and he didn't really campaign. And what we saw during the campaign and at present, which is very worrying, is a marginalization of professional media. So in his entire time in office, he has only met with journalists twice. He doesn't give interviews. He is very much controlling the message and choosing how he says things. And that is something that is quite worrying because it affects the way society perceives him and the issue of how much information is circulating in society. When political leaders refuse to make themselves accountable by facing journalists, then the image that he's able to present um, is, is a very distorted one. So the marginalization of professional media is a trend that we've seen so far, and I believe this will continue. That the second, excuse me, press conference he gave on the occasion of his one year of presidency uh, was very much in this post-Soviet style. It was very glamorous. It was this TV uh, experience. It was in the park. It was elegant. But if you look at who was invited, the access to the president was restricted. And the way the press conference was held, this is always the case. Who gets to ask questions? Who gets the microphone? Uh, it was very staged. And his press secretary, uh, Yulia Mendel, uh, she gave certain journalists uh, a lot of time with the microphone and other journalists, the microphone got turned off. And I think significant here is a journalist from uh, 112 was given quite a number of questions, whereas uh, Olive B. who's is critical of the president, was only allowed to ask one question and then the microphone got turned off. So the president has a, a relatively tense relationship with professional journalists, which I think doesn't serve society well. Another trend that I've noticed in the media since Zelensky became president, which also is concerning, is a loosening of restrictions, a lowering of barriers on Russian messages, Russian disinformation in Ukraine's media sphere. And during the previous president, there were a lot of measures taken to protect Ukrainian society and audiences from disinformation, from false narratives, and even from 
uh, Russian media in order to have a more balanced view, a more sort of Ukrainian perspective on what was going on in the news. And this is really disappearing under the Zelensky regime. And it is visible particularly on channels that are pro-Russian that are affiliated with people like Medvedchuk, this is News 1, uh, uh, 112, where we see quite a lot of pro-Russian information uh, regularly being broadcast. And something that caused a huge uproar is that uh, a, cha a concert from the Kremlin was broadcast on Victory Day, uh, which had participants who were banned by Ukraine's legislation from, from appearing in Ukraine and on Ukraine's media. And those restrictions have really loosened. And my impression based on the analysis that Zelensky sort of post-Soviet and doesn't really think about Ukraine, um, he's not actively promoting this, but he's simply not blocking this information. And so when you have people like Medvedchuk, people like Putnov, who are Shari, who have access to media outlets and they're not being uh, disciplined. And also we have a loosening of the restrictions of people who are allowed to appear in Ukraine's media sphere. Just recently, uh, the restriction was lifted on this Russian actress who's now able to travel freely to Ukraine. Um, I think all of these things have potentially negative consequences uh, for Ukraine society and Ukraine's media. Um, where I see a little bit of optimism is in the legislatory sphere, and this is where I'm gonna link it to civil society. In January, February, um, I was very concerned, a lot of observers were concerned that um, the President Zelensky and his team were trying to rein in journalists and trample freedom of speech. There were two laws that were being proposed and they are being fast-tracked through parliament uh, as much as many of the legislative acts are. Um, and one was the law on media, which was proposed by Alexander Kachenko, who uh, was at the time, he was the head of the parliamentary committee on, how many minutes have I got? Oh, three minutes, I better hurry up. Uh, he, uh, so the first law by Kachenko was a law on media, the second law was by Bogdansky, who was then Minister of uh, Youth, Culture, and Information Policy. And uh, both laws were being tabled and trying to be pushed through quickly. The law on media by Tkachenko was actually a pretty good law because it modernized a lot of the legislation and sort of pulled things together, regulating online media. The one that was worrying was the law on disinformation that was presented by Burgansky because that's the one where it appeared that Zelensky was trying to rein in the journalists where uh, they, the, the law proposed to create an official union of journalists. So the state would determine who can be a journalist. Uh, fake news and disinformation was criminalized. And basically the state, it looked like the state was trying to regulate the profession of journalism there was tremendous pushback from uh, the civil society, from professional media organizations, from journalists. And the, the law on disinformation was withdrawn. The law on media was actually taken for um, uh, further evaluation, and they've actually come up with a second draft. Now Tkachenko is the Minister of Information Policy. And that law is due to be looked at in Parliament on the 1st of July. So from a legislative point of view, we have an attempt to control the journalists, journalists pushing back, and the state and Zelensky's team pulling back. So I think that's kind of a positive note to end on, that um, journalists, civil society is much less active than it used to be. And Andriko, who I was speaking with yesterday, he said they are so they're sort of blissfully apathetic for, for the most part. But I don't know if I fully agree with that because when hot issues appear, society does pull, push back through these various organizations. Where I 
see a little bit of concern, and I would agree with um, Kulikov, is we're seeing a lot less activism by society in general. Um, I don't know if people are tired of, of participating, if they feel disillusioned. Um, the activists are still organizing things. There's going to be a protest uh, in support of Ukrainian language on the 28th of uh, June, which is Constitution Day. But we'll see how many people actually come out. And with the COVID crisis and the physical distancing and so on, I think that's given civil society and activists even more of a hit. But um, intelligentsia, I didn't get to talk about that. So maybe we'll leave that to the question period. The only thing is very briefly, I think in the Zelensky uh, period, intelligentsia has been marginalized like professional journalists. They're there, they're speaking up, but uh, Zelensky and his team, they're just not interested. They're interested in you know, making Ukraine work in a smartphone and not what intellectuals are saying. So I think I'll pause there and I'd be happy to answer questions. And I'm very curious to see what uh, the other panelist has to say. Because uh, I think we might have slightly different views. On before, before I turn to Alex, a couple of remarks. Uh, first, for if you want to pose questions to the panelists and there will be a chance to so pose them, you can use the either the Q&A mode or uh, uh, the, the chat mode, preferred to put it in the Q&A uh, uh, basket. So click on and ask away and we will make sure that uh, in the last 20 minutes or so we will weave them into our uh, our discussion and thank you already for we got about four questions in various formats so we will we will get to you in, in short order. Uh, as a transition I do want to say that surprisingly uh, there have been a number of frivolous criminal cases opened against former President Petro Poroshenko, 24 of them and we can potentially discuss them at some other point, but there was a very robust group of about four or 5,000 demonstrators that turned out to support him uh, in court and to march uh, with, uh, without him uh, in, 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 in his defense. And there was very uh, vigorous uh, presence and indeed uh, some violence uh, that uh, was reminiscent of some of the protests that we have seen in the Black Lives Matter uh, in the case of a, of a uh, of a far right activist, or Mr. Skrimenko, who was who is accused of murder or manslaughter uh, for having defended himself after two earlier murder attacks, and hun and hundreds of people swarmed to the court to defend him and to uphold him when his bail hearing was on, and there were pretty fierce. Uh, uh, so COVID, yes, but uh, there is some sign of a bit of of a bit of uh, 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 civic action and civic discontent. But Alex, for the for the broad overview of uh, processes and of the Zelensky uh, presidency, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk about very many things, so I'll be speaking somewhat telegraphically. And if you have any comments or questions, we can talk about them in greater detail afterwards. So for starters, with regard to foreign policy and security, uh, let me just start with the good news, and it's not, I mean, it's goodish, it's good, it's not bad. Um, but despite the fact that Zelensky's own national orientations are somewhat unclear, uh, the policy that he's pursued has been fairly solidly pro-West, pro-Europe, pro-American. So relations with the IMF are fine, relations with the European Union are good. As you know, just recently, the European Union extended sanctions on Russia. Relations with Germany, France, the UK, and the US are pretty good. Um, Ukrainians, Ukraine's relationship with NATO has also improved. It just recently in, in, uh, received something called enhanced opportunity status, which is a kind of, it's not membership, of course, but it's more than what it used to have. Um, and most importantly, the, uh, his policies toward the Donbass were, have turned out to be fairly okay, at least in any case, I'm not worried. I mean, people were afraid that he was going to give away the store and let the Russians take over as a result of the Steinmeier formula and so on and so forth. None of this has transpired. And indeed, um, the kinds of statements that he and his minions have been saying in Minsk or about Minsk 
have been pretty much reassuring and pretty much reflect the kinds of statements that were being made under Poroshenko. Uh, yes, to be sure, he still suffers from the illusion that peace is possible with Russia, or at least he seems to suffer from that delusion. On the other hand, maybe that's just a rhetorical trick. Um, on the other half of the equation, I mean, we need to take a brief look at Russia, because of course, uh, Ukrainian policy, I mean, regardless of whether it's security or foreign policy, is very much a function of what Mr. Putin's intentions are and what, what Mr. Putin's strengths or weaknesses are. Um, and as you know, this hasn't been a very good year well, for anybody, but certainly not for Vladimir Putin. Uh, in addition to the coronavirus crisis, his plans regarding the constitutional amendments were delayed. Uh, the parade was delayed. Uh, oil prices have fallen radically as a result of a stupid decision to embark on a war with Saudi Arabia. Sanctions have been extended. Siberia is in the process of melting the economy as a free fall, and on and on. Oh, and yes, let's before you know before I go on. I mean, there's the problem of Syria that seems to be turning into a quagmire. Libya is in working out, um, and many people conclude on the basis of these failures that his regime is in trouble. Uh, that he is in trouble, and regardless of the fact that he will, of course, win the referendum and will have will be able to stay in office for another 10 to 15 years, it seems likely that his hold on power will become and is indeed already fairly brittle. Some people say that means he won't be able to embark on foreign policy adventures. Others say that this is precisely what will lead him to embark on foreign policy adventures. I'll simply raise those two eventualities, and if you're interested, we can refer to them later on. On the other hand, what is important from the Ukrainian point of view is that Russia is getting weaker. Uh, it is not getting stronger, it's getting weaker. Um, and a weaker Russia may be a more dangerous Russia, but a weaker Russia is also a weaker Russia. And from the point of view of Ukraine's security priorities, a weaker Russia is not necessarily a bad thing. Let me shift now to domestic politics and start with the following. I mean, Zelensky's policies, and some of them have been alluded to by both Marta and Adrian, namely the persecution of Poroshenko, of other Maidan activists, his ambivalent attitude towards freedom of the press, and so on. And he's been criticized for being, some people have said he is like Yanukovych. I've even read statements saying that he is worse than Yanukovych. And the implication of that is, is that he's on the way to trying to build some kind of dictatorial or authoritarian regime. I'd like to suggest that that is extremely unlikely, not because he may not aspire to that. I have no idea whether he does or does not. Um, but the point is, in order to be a successful authoritarian, you need to have some kind of base in the state as well as in the society. Yanukovych had both. He controlled, he was in charge of, a, of the Donbass. He controlled the population of the Donbass. He had the support of organized crime. He had the support of significant portion of the oligarchs. And he could draw on the forces of coercion. And as you know, in the final analysis, that didn't save him. But nevertheless, he was able to build on that and move towards the creation of an authoritarian regime. Zelensky doesn't have any of that. He's got the support of roughly 50, 60, 70 percent who aren't sure why they support him other than the fact that he looks like a nice guy. He certainly doesn't support the internal police. He doesn't support the, KG, the Ukrainian Secret Service. He doesn't support them. He doesn't have the support of the National Guard, of the military, of the bureaucracy, of the state, the superficial state, the deep state, call it, call it what you like. I mean, none of those things are present. Uh, so at best, at best, what Zelensky may become is a, an aspiring tin pot authoritarian, uh, but never a successful tin pot authoritarian, at least not in the foreseeable future. Now, if he decides that he wants to transform all of these institutions into bases of support, that may work. I'm rather skeptical because in order to do that, you need to have some leverage, and that means either significant amounts of money or sinecures or some kind of influence peddling. 
And with the COVID crisis and with all sorts of other crises besetting Ukraine, Zelensky is simply in no position to do that. So I'm somewhat sanguine about his transformation into, say, Putin, or even into a Yanukovych type of individual. Quite the opposite. The problem with the Zelensky regime, if one can call it that, is not so much that there is an, uh, a, an agglomeration, accumulation of authority or power. It's rather that it's a dispersed, flabby, kind of undefined uh, administration. Um, and there are several reasons for that. The one, and the most obvious one, is, of course, Zelensky himself. Um, as many of his critics, me included, wrote in the uh, period before the elections of about a year ago, uh, the guy was a comedian. <laughs> that was his profession. He also has, he's also a businessman, to be sure, but he spent most of his adult life as a comedian in the entertainment business. I mean, um, and it would be like having Michael Jackson become president of the country. I mean, uh, he might be able to appeal to a certain proportion of the population, but it is highly unlikely that this kind of individual has the capacity, knowledge, skill set, and so on, to be able to create a, an effective administrative apparatus with effective, coherent policies. Um, many of his critics, again, me included, predicted that this was going to be the Achilles heel of his administration, the lack of experience. And it's turned out to be just that. And many of the problems that he's encountered over the last half year, especially over the last half year, may be explained in terms of that lack of skill sets. Um, people call him incompetent. If that's probably true, if you want to be a little more generous, you might simply say he suffers from lack of expertise. Whatever it is, uh, these qualities have not translated into effective policy making, nor have they translated into effective cadre policies. It's not surprising that Zelensky has been drawing on his pals. Uh, all presidents, all prime ministers do that. You bring in people you know. The problem isn't that so much. It's the fact that the people he knows are, the, are people like him. They're all entertainment people. They're all people who spent or build their careers over the last 10, 15, 20 years in the entertainment business, um, which doesn't exactly qualify them for policy making. And you can go through a whole list of individuals, or there are some 15 or 20 very prominent type types who assume positions of fairly importance, of, fair, of, of some importance within the Ukrainian security, foreign and domestic policy apparatuses who have no relationship to these things. And unsurprisingly, they may not be the best choices for those sorts of positions. And of course, by virtue of his animus to Poroshenko, and it's an animus that to me at least is somewhat irrational, but be that as it may, uh, that also disqualifies him, Zelensky that is, from being able to draw on people who have expertise in government apparatus, in government policy making, because those are individuals who are largely associated with Poroshenko. Uh, now there are some exceptions, of course, but by and large, he has effectively put himself into a box. I mean, he's, he can't quite draw on the people who, de who do have expertise, and hence he's forced to draw on the people, his pals, people he's comfortable with who don't necessarily have the expertise. Uh, the last point that I'd like to emphasize in terms of the incoherence and lack of professionalism that he's evinced is the party, servants of the people. And again, this was all predictable and it was predicted by many of his critics about a year ago. Namely, you know, yes, it's true, they won something like two thirds of the votes, that is to say the servants of the people party. But if you look at the composition of the party, who were these people? Well, basically, they were just a bunch of people who drew on. Some of them were literally found on the street. Um, the only thing they had in common was the fact that they claimed to be members of a party that supported Zelensky. Uh, it wasn't clear that they had any ideology, any politics, any economic programs in common. They happened to be serendipitously drawn from a variety of sectors of the economy, society, entertainment world, and other, uh, other sectors of, the Ukrainian, of, of Ukraine, put together, and then they formed a, what's called a mono-majority, 
uh, unsurprisingly, in the course of the last year, they've begun to shift and change. So roughly 75 no longer supports Zelensky at all. So he can now draw on, theoretically, about 175 deputies, but even those are fracturing. Some are now and you know, have been have been aligning themselves with various oligarchs. Some are simply there for the ride. They're prone to corruption because they know they won't get reelected, and so on. But in any case, this is not exactly the kind of parliamentary base that you need in order to push through effective policies. It worked for about half a year because they were beholden to Zelensky, he had the dynamism, he had the support of a variety of people, and that seemed to lead in certain directions that weren't all that bad. But increasingly, as they dissipated, as he began, became increasingly confused and now directed in terms of his priorities, the whole process, the whole project began fraying, not necessarily falling apart, but fraying. Prospects for the future, I've got two or so minutes on the end on this point. Um, some analysts have been suggesting that Zelensky is heading towards disaster and that sooner or later, possibly at the end of this year, he's going to resign. I'm not sure that's going to happen, but it's at least a possibility. Others are saying that he will be pushed into a corner by his own policies and by the opposition of others. He will call early elections for the Rada, he won't get a majority and will therefore be uh, more inclined to form a coalition with, let's hope that they're the pro-European, pro-Western policies. That may be more likely. Most likely is that uh, his party, the servants of the people will do relatively badly in the forthcoming local election scheduled for October uh, for a number of reasons. One is because they're fraying, two is because his popularity is on the decline, uh, but three, and very importantly, is that in, as a result of the COVID crisis, the various mayors and other local officials have come to the fore in Ukraine, they've taken the initiative, and they will now be able to profile themselves and arguably win even greater powers. This will put Zelensky into a box of sorts as well. He may still control the central governing apparatus, but he's likely to become increasingly less influential in the regions and the various communities. And that, again, the optimistic outcome would be that that will put the fear of God into him. And he'll realize that in order to have a successful three years, uh, you know, the remaining three years in his administration, he will need to draw on professional expertise, which means going outside his own buddies and going outside um, the servants of the people. That may very well transpire. Uh, alternatively, he won't learn that lesson, in which case he's likely to be what he's been over the last three, four months, a, you know, tolerably mediocre um, president who's done some pretty good things, who hasn't done anything stupidly catastrophic, um, which given Ukraine's, the, re the, the record of Ukraine's past presidents isn't necessarily the worst of possible outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm reminded of a uh, famous Scottish ballad called I know where I'm going and I know who's going with me. And I think we have the roots of the problems that are emerging in the Zelensky administration in, in those phrases. Uh, he doesn't have the horses to know who he's taking with him and he didn't come with a governing ideology. Uh, it, it's emblematic of where uh, the, the, the party was that it initially declared itself hired a chief ideologist, which is also a kind of a strange thing, who's now the deputy speaker of the parliament, who pronounced it was a libertarian party. Then a few months later, they had a convention in which they said, well, we have elements of libertarianism, but also elements of social democracy, which sort of showed a lot of confusion. And at the, mo at, at the same time, there was this fracturing among interest groups, a couple of which are actually ideological groups. There's a small group, I'd say 30 or 40 people that are very strongly patriotic, very tough on Russia, and they've been very vocal. Many of them intersect with the liberals, the ones who supported the first government and are concerned by the fact that people who hold more statist views uh, are uh, coming to the fore in 
various ministries. But again, Ukraine has this curious phenomenon that no matter what its politicians do, when they need uh, financing from the IMF and the World Bank, whether they are called Yulia Tymoshenko or, uh, you know, Azarov or depending on who the prime minister is, even Petro Poroshenko, they are sometimes compelled to do certain things in reform as a condition of an extremely onerous and detailed uh, agenda that is set for them by the West. It's a little bit unfortunate because it's a surrender of sovereignty on the one hand, but it is also uh, a kind of a sad commentary that coherent approaches to policy making have not uh, developed. And, and so maybe we could talk a little bit about that. You know, Marta asked, uh, you know, uh, what motivated him? And I think I am drawn to the idea that what motivated him is a kind of a, an honest desire to want to fix things and to do good. And the kind of blind self-confidence of a young man who had done successful things with everything he had touched had been a success from age 21 when he shot into like competitive, uh, you know, uh, uh, contests, uh, comedy contests and moved on into producing entertainment projects and so on. He had a sense of mastery and I think he thought he could bring it with him. And I still don't think that his fundamental instinct is wrong. I think that the real problem that Alex uh, indicated and uh, Martha uh, alluded to uh, is, uh, you know, not knowing what, it, not having what it takes to get to where he wants, he wants to go. Uh, so if you want to, Martha, you have to unmute, but maybe we can ask you to uh, uh, join in and also Alex, maybe respond a little bit uh, about where from this you're heading. Alex, you said middling, but middling what? Middling zigzagging between liberalism and uh, statism, uh, zigzagging between efforts to rein in the press and then pushing back when he's got protest or just kind of finding a, a middle ground and a middle road that will allow him to maintain support. He's lost a lot of support lately to Boyko and Shari and the sort of Ruski Mir and pro-Russian side of the population. Uh, he has not yet shed some of his support from the, I would, I would say, central and West Ukrainian part of his electorate, and partly because of the unpopularity of President Poroshenko, who has a very firm 25% of ardent supporters, but can't, the people, the rest of the population has written him off. So there's no alternative for sort of patriotic reformers who don't like Poroshenko to, to you know, and, and, the, and the collapse and the lack of interest of uh, Slavko Vakarchuk in the, in the uh, reform project have also contributed to this lack of uh, alternative. So where do we see in that environment, maybe we can talk a couple minutes each of where you see Ukraine might be headed in the next three years uh, uh, as in, in these zigs, zeg, zigs and zegs. Well, I don't disagree with you that um, Zelensky clearly has goodwill and wants to do good and the New Year's Eve speech that he gave uh, this year. You know, he wants unity, he wants peace, he wants, um, you know, diversity. We want everybody to be friends. Uh, but where he's a little tone deaf is that he doesn't sort of see that there's different views of Ukraine. And that phrase that a lot of people noticed, he said, we want the roads to be paved and well lit. It doesn't matter what they're called doesn't matter what they're named. So the it's this sort of uh, contradiction that on the one hand, there is this goodwill. On the other hand, there's not hearing what different people are saying and picking up on what Alex said is a lack of uh, political experience. I don't agree that there are no competent people. I think, you know, when Shuruk was a very competent prime minister, um, but Zelensky expected him to perform miracles really quickly. And I think that's a lack of understanding of how politics and economics work. And it's that populist thing. It's like getting those likes, getting that audience response right away without understanding that there's going to be some difficult steps there. 
and the sort of when I was talking about the post-Soviet attitude, I was quite appalled at the way President Zelensky called out former Prime Minister Mancharuk like a naughty schoolboy and sat him down and said, now you must do better, blah, blah, blah. That was, I thought, very unprofessional. Uh, but the answer that you're looking for, what can we expect, Adriana? I think we need to be concerned about the fact that Zelensky is allowing people who have clearly anti-Ukrainian positions pretty much free reign in the political arena. And when his popularity is dropping, it is people like Boyko that their popularity is rising. And those people have a very clear agenda as opposed to Zelensky, who doesn't seem to have a really good agenda, uh, but these people do. And they want to reverse all of the accomplishments that have happened over the past 30 years. And they have media resources they have economic resources. And I don't know that Zelensky's picking up on the fact that this is a huge problem that he needs to put down. He's focusing his energies on fighting with Poroshenko, who even though I thought was the great president, now has no political power. So this is a non-issue. And the real issues that he's not paying attention to. And because he doesn't give interviews, media, can make comments, but he's not held accountable for any of that because he's not speaking to the media. So I see that as a huge problem. Alex? Yes, I'm, Martha outlined the, the sort of the bad tendencies, the bad forces, and I think quite right, rightly so, that are pushing Zelensky in the wrong direction. Uh, but there are three tendencies that are pushing him, as it were, in the right direction that we should keep in mind. And again, I don't mean to suggest that they necessarily outweigh the one that you just raised. Uh, one is that he is pretty much following the trajectory set by Poroshenko, by and large. It's still a pro-Western trajectory, pro-EU, pro-NATO, pro-IMF, pro-World Bank, pro-Germany, pro-France, pro-US, pro-et cetera, et cetera. Um, that has to be kept in mind. That's extremely important. And we see that in the kinds of policies that have been adopted regarding land reform, uh, the banking laws, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, those are significant accomplishments, not necessarily his initiatives, because it seems to me that he's simply building on what was already there. But the point is, he had a choice. He could have gone in the other direction, but he didn't. Uh, so we at least have to give him credit for that. I mentioned briefly the Donbass. There were fears that he would sell the store, but he hasn't. And it looks like they have reached the impasse that everybody was predicting, that you really can't make any progress unless Putin decides that he's going to permit you to make progress. So that seems to be the reality as well. That's the good news. So in other words, um, you know, he's on that trajectory. And if you like, the force of inertia is in some sense pushing him in that particular direction. Also good is the point that Adrian made several minutes ago, namely, that a whole bunch of Western institutions, the ones that I outlined, are essentially supportive of Ukraine. Uh, some of them have lost their enthusiasm for Zelensky, but they're still supportive of Ukraine, and they're pushing him, as well as Ukraine, in a pro-Western direction. Again, NATO, EU, US, and so on and so forth. Very important. Again, uh, this is not unusual, as we all know. I mean, uh, external actors always have an impact on the internal policies of states, especially of weak states. Uh, that happens all the time in Africa, Asia, South America, Central America, and as well as Canada. They're and, not a weak state. I know, but weaker. <laughs> We're a middle power. My, my point being, it happens all the time. So why shouldn't it happen in the case of Ukraine? And it's a good thing. The final point I'd like to make is that pushing Ukraine in the direction of the West, more arguably even more than the Poroshenko trajectory, arguably even more than the attractiveness of the West, is of course the man who's made contemporary Ukraine into a nation and who's made the state into a formidable force in the region, and that is Vladimir Putin. Um, as long as he maintains his policy of imperialism, uh, sort of bringing in the, the ingathering of Russian lands, he will be making it extremely difficult for anybody but people like Yanukovych and Boyko to not to be Ukrainian patriots of one kind or other. 
essentially Putin closes off the option of being semi-pro-Russian. You either have to join the Russian Federation or not, and if you don't join, then effectively you are an enemy of the Russian Federation, according to Putin. Uh, so in a way, you know, again, thank God for Putin from that particular point of view, but his particular impact on Ukraine has been, in that regard, very salutary, because he is pushing Ukraine toward the West, just as the West is pulling Ukraine toward itself, just as Poroshenko set a trajectory that is essentially pro-Western as well. So in a way, what that means for Zelensky is unless he can actually get his act together and then consciously embark on a systematic, long-standing pro-Russian policy, which to my mind sounds very unlikely, he will be pushed by all these three forces in a, let's call it, moderately pro-Western direction for the next three years. Oh, it'll I be don't disagree with you. I'm just going to jump in here and say, I think that Ukraine is already a European country, and a lot of Western values are already part of the political elite. So I don't know that it's this tug of war pulling, pushing Ukraine. I think that discussion is... Is, is, has already happened. I think there's a certain portion of society that still has views that are different. Um, and I don't know if those people are convincible. But anyway, there's a bunch of questions. So I'll let maybe some other questions. Let me, uh, let me uh, hone in a little bit. Well, first of all, he has four more years. So it's he's just starting with, like, he's an American president. He's just been elected. Uh, he, can, he has a pretty long chunk of time to either do or not do things. But here's an interesting question that part of the whole issue of the recess, there was a poll that showed that 31% of Ukrainians have a positive view of the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union positive institution. I was just shocked. And it's a majority in the East or in the South, but it's, it's mind boggling. And I think it, it reflects a little bit of the kind of the vagueness of the post-Sovietness of uh, of, 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 of Zelensky uh, uh, himself, a kind of an ambivalence. I'm not saying he's pro-Soviet. And in fact, his electorate is not very pro-Soviet. The most pro-Soviet electorate, of course, is Boykos. The second most are Lashkos and Yulia Tymoshenko. So that's very, very interesting. Uh, but here's a question from an anonymous attendee, but it's a great question. How would you describe to what degree Zelensky was, is, and will be Ukrainian, whatever it means to be a Ukrainian? Does he reflect the current confusion of what it means to be Ukrainian? And what does this imply? That's not the question that's asked. I'm adding for state building, nation building, and the agenda of the government. I go first. Okay, you yeah, know, I think that's an excellent question. And I think a lot of people who study Ukraine, we uh, theorize things in very traditional ways. What this past election showed me is that. Uh, the issue of identity is, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's both more positive and more negative. And I don't know how many people have actually watched Slohan Lerodu, uh, the, the actual show that made Zelensky even more famous. And it's that sort of blend of Soviet culture with a modern sort of twist with the Ukrainian flavor. So someone like Zelensky grows up Russian speaking um, and now he's putting on a Vishivanka and um, his prime minister still says that, you know, the war started on the 22nd of June and then gets criticized and says, oh no, of course, I mean, like it didn't start. So there's these historical and cultural reference points are still very much part of many Ukrainians' identity, but equally there's this new layering of sort of the folk stuff is hip, and so people are absorbing that. I think there's just this huge transformation happening, and I see it happening with Zelensky. Like he put on a Vishivanka for Vishivanka, they that one's a Prime Minister Trudeau, and Maybe that's like the first time in his life that he put on a Vishvanka because it's kind of hip now. Um, and it's a cultural marker of some sort. I don't know if that answers your question, but the short answer is it's, it's an evolving identity and it's kind of fascinating. And I think 
sociologists really need to be doing research on this because it's hard to sort of pin it down. I don't know what all this would say. Dr. Moon. Very briefly, uh, I, I'm a firm believer in the adage that where you stand depends on where you sit. I especially believe that to be true for political elites. Um, you know, before you're elected, you are whoever it is that you are. Once you become president or prime minister of a country, you suddenly discover that you love the culture, you love the food, <laughs> you love the history. Uh, you may never have, I mean, you know, look at Kravchuk. I mean, he spent all his life in the counter propaganda apparatus of the Communist Party fighting Ukrainian nationalism. I mean, he was actually opposed to Ukrainian nationalism, and he's the guy who created a Ukrainian state and a Ukrainian nation, arguably. Uh, you don't have to be a Yushchenko in order to become or act like a patriot. You can also be a Kuchma. Uh, as a matter of fact, you even saw those sorts of tendencies in Yanukovych on various moments. Yanukovych. Right? Um, so what I'm struck by is the fact that Zelensky, increasingly in his rhetoric and in his behavior, Magda spoke of the embroidered shirts, uh, but he keeps on talking about Ukraine, our Ukraine, we Ukrainians, and things of that sort. Um, and he has to. There is no alternative. The alternative is to sell the country, uh, but become an unsuccessful TV producer in uh, the south of Ukraine again. Well, that's just not an option. You need to have some kind of legacy. You, need to, you want to leave some kind of legacy that, that puts you in a more or less favorable light in a historian's point of view. And that means he's got to be president of Ukraine, whatever that means for him. But if nothing else, it means speaking in Ukrainian, wearing a better shirt, and referring to Ukraine and its interests, and trying to defend whatever that is and whatever those interests are in the international arena. Uh, so we have a comment from uh, Mikhail Vinnitsky, who teaches and analyzes uh, trends in Ukraine. And he says that the growing opposition to Zelensky is getting increasingly angrier in this latest period. Growing numbers of people uh, in Kyiv, particularly the intelligentsia, are willing to go out in the streets to protest. For the moment, they're pro, many of them are pro Poroshenko, but that is changing because there are disillusioned Zelensky voters, including now former ministers, and Honcharuk has been very sharp in some of his criticisms, who are uh, joining them and sort of uh, uh, piling on. Uh, any any thoughts about, I mean, Zelensky does seem to be sensitive to not just the West, the expectations, economic pressure, da, 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 uh, but to public opinion, but also to a degree to the, to the streets. He had a very wobbly approach to the Russian negotiations. And when people started turning out in the, in the streets, he kind of uh, 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 pulled, uh, pulled back on that. Any, any comment about the current mood and how that might affect uh, which way he directs policy. Well, Mikhailo, thank you for that comment. Um, I can understand why people are increasingly disappointed and uh, protesting and so on. Um, I think it's also important to keep in mind that uh, as Zelensky's majority is starting to crumble, uh, he's going to need allies. And there are a number of political forces in parliament that he could turn to for allies. So Hollis is kind of falling apart. Poroshenko's team is actively against him. So who does that leave? So if he is criticized tremendously and he needs votes, he is quite likely to turn to the uh, pro-Russian parties. And that I think would have a significant change in Ukraine's direction, because I agree that so far he has been following the path of, you know, European, NATO, all of those things. But that could change if he needs to find votes well, for well. other things. So I think there's got to be a nice balance between acting as watchdogs and being critical of things that need to be criticized, but not to the point that you know, he's going to turn to uh, Michael and others as his political allies. I, I think it's very hard for him to turn in that direction of Boyko and so on. First of all, Poroshenko has offered, as has Julia Poroshenko, uh, 
uh, you know, her, their services to bolster the government for different intentions. Poroshenko from the PAP, you know, I'm, I'm prepared to support a patriotic direction for the country and to unify forces, et cetera, et cetera. And that has been uh, dismissed by uh, that gesture has been dismissed and 24 criminal cases have been opened up, most of them frivolous against, against Poroshenko. Uh, on the other hand, he is already losing a lot of, he can't out Boyko Boyko without losing part of his uh, electorate. And he's already lost a lot of the Boyko electorate because as Alex has pointed out, uh, the chair makes you more Ukrainian. And that disappoints that part of the electorate which is leaving him, which may have wanted him to kind of do a, can't we all get along hug of, of Putin. Uh, and so I think he's, he's shedding some of that, that vote. We have a, one question, uh, which I think is very important. Maybe Alex, you can tackle it. The Ukrainian states uh, from another Vinnytsky, this one, Julian, uh, they're dominating the questions. The Ukrainian state's inability to codify a functional Western legal system is probably the, the significant stumbling block for its integration into the civilized world. What can Zelensky or what can be done to push this? Is there any fix for this perennial problem of the Ukrainian uh, courts and the justice system? Gosh, you know, fixing, we know we keep on saying that you, know, you need to have rule of law because without a rule of law, nothing else quite functions. Well, rule of law takes time. I mean, it, you don't just pass a few laws and then you have rule of law. Uh, it requires a change in culture, a change in political culture, uh, the construction of effective institutions, the willingness on the part of the elites as well as the publics. I mean, it's a very complicated long-term process. So, you know, what should he do? Well, obviously he shouldn't violate the institutions that do exist. He should try to improve them as much as possible. But even assuming Zelensky were to do everything just right, as we would recommend that he do, you wouldn't have rule of law within a day. I mean, it would, take, it would still take years, if not decades, and perhaps even longer. The thing that we need to keep in mind is that you can have semi-functional rule of law, that is to say rule of law that is short of the ideal, and still have a perfectly fine society. I mean, take Italy before COVID. You know, how many of you went on vacation to Italy? I suspect most of you would gladly have gone there and you know, it was a perfectly livable society and yet rule of law is pretty much foreign to the Italian political culture. Ditto for Greece. Um, I can speak about Austria in some respect. I mean, there's far more rule of law than in Italy or Greece, but there too is somewhat on shaky grounds. People say, you know, you, you know, without rule of law, you'll never have any investments. Well, then how do you explain the fact that during the Yanukovych regime, there was tons of investment coming in? There were tons of investment coming in under Kuchma as well. The point is investors, yes, they want rule of law, but what they want most of all is predictability and stability. And that's why they always invest in dictatorships because dictators are pretty stable guys. So it's not a question of rule of law per se. It's a question of an increasing rule of law. And here, you know, so far Zelensky's record isn't very good as we know. He hasn't quite yet done anything remarkably egregiously stupid. Although if he does jail Poroshenko, that might qualify as just such a point, right? Uh, so, I'd say when it comes to rule of law, be patient, take a deep breath, have a beer, have some popcorn, and let's see how things work out. In the meantime, there's nothing to stop you from introducing serious economic reform. There's nothing to stop you from introducing uh, a more stable democracy, media freedoms, and things of that sort. All those things can be done and can be done significantly, even if rule of law is short of perfection. So uh, we're trying to answer the big picture of where Zelensky is headed in the next uh, four years. And I'm not sure we have quite a degree of clarity other than kind of the traditional muddling through and no great, you know, being driven by some of the currents that uh, Poroshenko set uh, in motion and also by the objective reality of Putin and Western uh, pressures and so on. Uh, but there's a question, is there a successful Central or East European country that uh, Ukraine and Zelensky might uh, emulate? Is there a good model for Ukraine to look at? <laughs> Can I address this? Look, th I, thank you for the question. This is wonderful. I mean, everybody's favorite two East European countries for the last 30 years were Poland 
<laughs> to Poland. And Hungary, because Poland and Hungary got it right, quote unquote. That was always a phrase that everybody used. They got it. Right. <laughs> Look, behold, at Look at them now. Look at them now. How is that possible? Well, that just goes to show that there is no cookie cutter approach to these transitions to democracy. I mean, there is no such thing as getting it right at point A and getting it right at point B and then so on down the road. Every decision you make leads to a variety of possibilities, a variety of good and bad possibilities, and then you, and even a bad possibility, a bad outcome may turn out to have a good outcome. You don't know these things in advance. You need to build these things slowly and what seems to have worked in the early 1990s, as it did in Poland, may not work in the late 2000s, as it did not in Poland, uh, or perhaps in Ukraine or Russia or other places. One needs to have certain strategic priorities in mind. One needs to build on the experience of other countries, but have to keep at the same time one's own peculiarities in, uh, in, in mind. Uh, and there is, as, as I said, there is no formula we need to disabuse ourselves of the notion that there is a formula. There is no formula. Take one of the most successful countries in Europe today, Germany. If you follow, I mean, so what? Is Ukraine supposed to start two world wars and inflict a genocide? Is that the formula? No, of course not. Should it be occupied by the United States? That, by the way, might not be a bad idea, but that's... Oh, no, no, not the United States under this no, no, current no. president. Forget. Yeah, well, Canada, by all means. Uh, I, I love your answer. I just want to jump in here. Um, I'd like to turn it over and say the question, you know, what Ukraine needs to do to be better could be rephrased because I think Ukraine's actually done tremendously well. I mean, it's been 30 years since it became a state. And with all the problems that it's faced, political, economic, internal, external, demographic, environmental, uh, I think it's achieved a tremendous amount. And in this latest war, I mean, who would have expected Ukraine to fight this war to a draw, as Brian Whitmore said? You know, it's the largest army in Europe, the second largest in the world, is assaulting Ukraine, and they pretty much fought them to a draw, and they're holding them back. And all the pressures they're having, there is freedom of speech in Ukraine. There is a vibrant economy. There is there, sure, there are a lot of problems, but I mean, it's the American Institute that's hosting this lovely event. Look at your own country. I'm sorry, it's like what model should the United States be following to eliminate racism and nepotism and um, all of these other horrible things that the systemic problems that this established democracy is facing? I mean, you heard me criticize both the president and all the things, but I think we really need to have a perspective that it's actually quite a success story. And part of the media narratives and academic narratives that I really find problematic is the focus is always on the problems and how should Ukraine be fixing that and what should they be listening to as opposed to looking at all the positive things that they have achieved. Um, there's this, uh, if those of you who are interested in economics, I'm not, but I follow it just to see it. There's so many positive things happening in Ukraine's economy, and yet we don't talk about it, we don't hear about it very often. It's always about the problems, and the legal system has made tremendous progress over the past 30 years. In the education system, in all sorts of spheres, there's been tremendous progress, and I think the question we're looking at today is what challenges we're facing moving forward, given the person who's the president, political party that surrounds him, the economic elites that are influencing him, and what society is thinking. Well, uh, let me uh, say that we've had amazing questions. I will ask one in conclusion, and that is, uh, you know, there is some fear of selective persecution uh, of cases against civic activists uh, a case has just been opened up against uh, a reformist uh, uh, former minister of infrastructure, Volodymyr Melan. Like I said, 24 cases against President Poroshenko. The question is, is there a danger that the persecution of political adversaries uh, will essentially turn uh, the West away, uh, away, away from Ukraine? And maybe to kind of weave into that question, since 
we have where we are the Ukrainian Institute of America. Maybe do you see the Biden administration, uh, if there is such a thing, uh, being af affected by the, uh, the, the the fact that there's now a criminal case against uh, Mr. Poroshenko for his conversations with with Joe Biden? So that's a sort of a echoing the the concerns about how the West will proceed. Maybe a drift away, if not towards we accept. I think Alex made a convincing point. It's not going to be convincing authoritarianism, but it might be the trappings of authoritarianism. Uh, is there a danger that Western, we used to have, you know, Western fatigue with Ukraine. We used to have the threat of a loss of support since Putin. How do you, how do you see Ukraine in the next few years if it takes, if it takes the wrong, the wrong path on these issues? Oh, you want me to go first? Sure. Um, no, I'm really glad you raised that question because this is something that I think is concerning to all of us. The, my question is, where is this coming from? Who's behind it? Uh, because I can't see this as part of Zelensky's vision agenda. Maybe with Poroshenko, he's being vindictive, but with all of these other cases, who's pushing that? And it seems to me that it's people who are from the Maidan generation, uh, that are being targeted, and it's, I don't have an answer to why this is happening, because this is, first of all, ludicrous. I mean, the charges against someone like the Jana Trumavol and all those others, they're absolutely ludicrous charges, and they are very detrimental to the president and his, um, his team, never mind, as you said, Ukraine's image. So I don't have an answer to why this is happening. So maybe those people who do, but I can't see that this is on Zelensky's agenda. Like, I don't see that he's going, like, why would he be going after these people that serves no interest? Like, it doesn't serve anything that I see as he wants to be accomplishing. So that, I, I don't have a good answer to that. Well, maybe Alex has. Alex, anything to say? <laughs> Just very briefly, um, I mean, obviously these persecutions, which is what they are, uh, are not going to help him or the country, certainly not him and his country's image as well. On the other hand, how serious will the damage be? Well, on the one hand, keep in mind there's the coronavirus crisis, and for better or for worse, uh, Ukraine will not exactly be in the headlines for the next half year to a year, perhaps even longer. Um, that's bad for the world, but it will deflect attention from what's going on in Ukraine. And I suspect will also deflect attention by Western governments from some of the malfeasance that may occur within the uh, Zelensky regime. Um, but my final point relates to the factor that I mentioned before. Um, Ukraine's relations with the West are, tend to be bad when the West relations with Russia are good. Ukraine's relations with the West tend to be good when, you, when, West, when the West relations with Russia are bad. In as much as Mr. Putin is the key factor in the formulation of Russian policy toward the world, toward Ukraine, and especially toward the West, and in as much as his policy toward the West is more or less unremittingly negative, um, he is playing a very important role in maintaining a fairly decent, fairly positive relationship between Ukraine and the West. Not necessarily because the West loves Ukraine, but because it fears Putin. So as long as he remains fearful, and my guess is he will remain fearful for a good period of time, that will work to Ukraine's advantage and, of course, to Zelensky's advantage as well. well thank you, panel. Before I turn it over to Kathy Malavaiko to say, final words and maybe a report on future activities. I just want to thank you for a very uh, lively panel and really wonderful questions, only a portion of which we got uh, to ask, but I think we covered a lot, of, a lot of ground. And I think importantly, we held our audience, uh, we held about 85% of the initial audience of a couple hundred people. So, and, and there are other people watching on other social media, including YouTube and the like. So thank you, Kathy, for, and your team for such a wonderful opportunity. Uh, to share with uh, the broader community uh, important uh, views of important things that are going on in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian, and, and thank you, Mata and Alex.
uh, for leading such an informed and stimulating discussion and offering your very unique perspectives on the situation in Ukraine. Uh, I think the one thing that has become obvious is that you know there are a lot of questions and not a lot of clear answers. But uh, when I find my crystal ball, I'll be sure to uh, organize another webinar so that we can all uh, figure that out quickly. Um, I'd also, I'd also like to thank everybody in the audience uh, for joining us this evening. While I realized, as Adrian mentioned, that we were unable to answer uh, many of your questions, we had well over 30 questions in the Q&A and many in the chat room. Um, please stay tuned for future events uh, that will address a variety of topics, uh, including the unfolding situation in Ukraine. Uh, but for this evening, obviously, we want to be mindful of everybody's time, especially uh, that of our panelists, who, again, have so graciously <clears throat> uh, donated their time and expertise uh, you know, to this discussion. Um, if you did enjoy this evening's uh, webinar, uh, please make sure to spread the word. Uh, the webinar was recorded and it can be found and on the Ukrainian Institute's YouTube channel. Um, and there will be links posted on our Facebook page and also on our website. So uh, if you have friends that were unable to attend and that uh, you know, you think might enjoy uh, tonight's discussion, please make sure to let them know. Um, and of course, please continue to check into our website for um, upcoming events of all kinds. We do have uh, a panel discussion planned for probably uh, late July, uh, dealing with the coronavirus situation, uh, both here in the United States and in, in Ukraine. We have a panel of medical experts that will be joining us. So please stay tuned for that. Um, if you have not shown your appreciation by making a donation yet, we would certainly appreciate it. No amount is too small. So um, thank you very much for keeping us uh, you know, in mind in that regard. And um, in the meantime, uh, be well and stay safe. Thank you again to everyone and have a great night. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Thank you.